Are you tired of feeling like your brain is running on empty? Do you struggle through a haze of brain fog? Do you feel unmotivated and low energy? Well, get ready to revitalize your brain health because today we're diving deep into the three non-negotiables that can boost your brain power. From the air you breathe to the food that you eat, you will learn the three most important things to focus on to unlock your brain's full potential. I'm Dr. Peter Kahn, board certified chiropractic neurologist and functional medicine practitioner. Now, too often, I see people who struggle with poor brain function looking for a magic pill or some off-the-wall stuff while ignoring these three non-negotiable factors. If you do that, you might end up wasting a lot of money and time while getting nowhere fast. So the key to boosting your brain power is to first understand and then focus on the primary needs of the neuron, the individual brain cells that give you the capacity to think, move, and feel. Now, all brain cells or neurons need three things in order for not only peak function, but just for them to stay alive. The first thing for the neuron needs is fuel. And the primary source of fuel for neurons comes in the form of oxygen and glucose. Now, oxygen comes from the air that you breathe, but also comes from the ability to deliver that oxygen in your blood to your tissue. So this is gonna be breathing and perfusion. Perfusion meaning your body's ability to deliver blood to your tissue, and that's gonna come down to circulation as well as blood pressure. So a situation here could be that you have low blood pressure. Maybe your blood pressure is much lower than normal. What's normal blood pressure? 120 over 80. If your blood pressure is much below that, and you're actually getting lightheadedness, dizziness, especially if when you change position from sitting to getting up, that's called orthostatic hypotension, that can compromise your ability to deliver blood to your brain, and that's gonna compromise your brain function because it's not getting enough fuel. On the other hand, you can also have problem with anemia. Anemia is where the blood that's, that you're carrying doesn't have enough oxygen, doesn't have enough red blood cell, not enough hemoglobin, which is the oxygen carrying capacity of, of your red blood cell, then that can compromise oxygen as well. And in breathing, some people shallow breathe, they don't breathe deeply, they're stressed, they never really learn how to take a deep breath, no meditation or deep breathing practice. So that can be a problem. So how can we improve oxygen? Well, first of all, we can just breathe. Deep breathing exercise can be very helpful. You want to try to slow down your breathing so that you have that rhythmic breathing that only help you to take in more air, but also help you with heart rate variability and help with your vagus nerve relaxation response as well. So we can simply do box breathing, which is five second breathe in, five second hold, five second exhale, five second hold. If you repeat that, that's gonna be a 20 second cycle. That's gonna slow your breathing way down. It's gonna help you to take deeper air in and that's gonna help with oxygen delivery. The other side of this is also exercise. Exercise can improve oxygen delivery. There's two specific forms that you wanna to do to improve and boost your brain power. First is aerobic exercise. And when we're doing, talking about aerobic, that's not the same as cardiovascular. We're not saying the same thing. Cardiovascular exercise is any exercise that causes your cardiovascular system to be, to be worked. Anything that can raise heart rate. So that means even sprinting. Now sprinting is not aerobic. Sprinting is anaerobic. So we wanna focus on the aerobic here, which is a low intensity, steady state exercise, like walking, brisk walk, or even slow jog. And the way that you determine something's aerobic by looking at your heart rate. Your heart rate should be below a certain threshold. Uh, we use the Maffetone method, which is 180 minus your age. That becomes your maximum heart rate that you don't train above. So if someone is 50 years old, 180 minus 50, then that means their maximum training heart rate to stay aerobic will be 130. So you're trained between 120 to 130. Give yourself a 10 beat range and that's gonna help you to stay in that aerobic zone. The other thing that can be very helpful is high intensity interval training. So that's the opposite of aerobic, right? We're talking about high intensity. However, this will be intervals. So that means you're having, say, a 10 second sprint and, ver and then uh, 
you know, 40 second rest. Typically, I like a one to four ratio or spr of sprint to recovery. So you, you will sprint for, say, anywhere between 10 seconds to 30 seconds, and you multiply it by four, that will be your walk or recovery walk. And you'll repeat that anywhere from four to eight sets of that. And then that'll help you to get that gush of blood in your tissue because you're doing high intensity and your blood flows really fast. It's gonna get blood flow to your brain. And research showed that high intensity interval training can help increasing uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And that's a, a comp compound that's produced in your brain that can promote brain plasticity, neuroplasticity. On the anemia side, you want to do lab tests to rule out the possibility of, possibility of anemia. If you have anemia, you need to identify what's causing the anemia. It could be iron deficiency. It could be absorption issues. It could be parasites even. It can be things like chronic disease. If you have chronic inflammation, chronic illness, that can also cause anemia. Heavy menstrual cycle could be a reason. So we want to identify whether you have anemia and then identify the cause of that anemia. With low blood pressure, what you can do is simply add some salt. Use natural sea salt. The ratio I will use will be one teaspoon to a liter of water. You can sip that over a couple of hours and that might be enough to raise the blood pressure, although you have to check. You just get a blood pressure cuff, measure your blood pressure. If that's not enough, you can do a second one, another teaspoon in a liter of water, say one in the morning, one in the afternoon. That'll help with hydration. Just by increasing fluid volume, that will already push the blood pressure up. If you already have, if you have low blood pressure to begin with, then using sea salt may be a strategy to raise the blood pressure so that you can have better perfusion and that can help. And by the way, salt is also very important for your action potentials, for your brain cells to fire a neural signal. It needs proper amount of sodium. So sea salt may be a solution for you if you have low blood pressure. And then for circulation, obviously that comes back to exercise. So that's how you will solve an oxygen problem or improve it so that you, you can boost your brain function. Next is glucose. Now with blood sugar, much the problem is a stability problem. You may have low blood sugar, you may have high blood sugar, or you may have blood sugar that's up and down like a roller coaster. Either case, your brain doesn't like it when you don't get steady glucose to your brain. It doesn't like it if you shoot up your blood pressure or your blood sugar by eating a really sugary snack. It doesn't also, also doesn't like it when your blood sugar crashes and you don't do well with that. So the key here is to identify whether you have a low blood sugar tendency, a high blood sugar tendency, or you have a mixed pattern. This can be done by lab tests, or you can ask yourself, do I feel not so good when I don't eat? Do I feel, and it's not just hungry, it's a brain sensation. Do you feel lightheaded, shaky, irritable, hangry when you don't eat? And then eating relieves that. If you do, then that's a low blood sugar pattern. If you feel fatigue after you eat, feel sleepy, drowsy after you eat, then you have more of a high blood sugar insulin resistant pattern. Right? So if you have low blood sugar, then the way to solve that will be to eat small frequent meals. And the composition of the meal is important too. You can't just eat small frequent meal, but it's like Snickers bar and Skittles. It's gotta be the right food. And that right food will be something that's high in protein, fat, and fiber. Protein, fat, and fiber. So it looks like vegetables, salads, vegetable with olive oil in it, that's your fat, avocado, and then some protein, could be chicken, fish, grass-fed beef, in the proper portion, in even portions. If you do that, you're gonna be able to stabilize your blood sugar better, and then you wanna eat smaller, frequent meals to keep that blood sugar steady if you have low blood sugar. If you have high blood sugar, you can do the same thing with that meal composition, higher protein, higher fat, higher fiber content, definitely reduce the carbohydrate intake, right, especially refined carbs. Uh, for people with insulin resistance, fasting can be a strategy, intermittent fast or longer term fast. Exercise is gonna be really important because when you exercise, you burn off the excess glucose in your bloodstream, it goes to your muscle to do work, and that can help lower the blood sugar as well. Now, on a supplement perspective, to improve oxygen, we wanna pay particular attention to supplements that can improve not just circulation, 
but also cerebral perfusion, because we're talking about boosting brain power, right? So things that can help there is vimpocetin. Vimpocetin is a natural supplement that can improve cerebral perfusion. There's some study that shows that vimpocetin given to people with stroke injuries can actually improve that blood flow after a stroke. Now, also another compound that's helpful here is ginkgo. Ginkgo biloba is an also another supplement that can increase blood flow all over, but also including the brain as well. Uh, and for oxygen, just pure improving blood pressure, we might want to consider beets or beetroot extract. Beets can improve nitric oxide production, and nitric oxide promotes blood flow. And beets can also, imp and in your brain specifically, you also have nitric oxide production there, which can help with neuroplasticity. So beets can be something that could be helpful for circulation. On the blood sugar side, supplement-wise, in addition to the dietary strategies, that can be things like your B complex, vitamin Bs, like your B1, B2, B3, all very important in energy metabolism, mitochondrial function, B6, B12 folate, all the Bs are important. Here, chromium and vanadium are minerals that are very important in blood sugar metabolism. Herbal compounds for people with high blood sugar, we can consider berberine and gymnema. These are all herbal compounds that has been shown to help improve insulin function. Genema has been shown to support pancreatic function. So these are supplements we can consider to support blood sugar stability in addition to lifestyle strategies. So we talked about fuel as one of the primary requirements and that fuel comes in the form of oxygen and glucose. Another requirement for neuron is activation. So activation means that your brain cells have to be working. You don't use it, you lose it, as the old adage goes. And that's ever more true for neurons, your brain cells. So how do you activate the brain cells? Well, you can activate it through physically, physical activity or mental activity. So what does that mean, physical activity? Well, when you move your arm, you're activating the motor pathway. So you're activating your neurons through physical activity. That's why exercise is so great. Now, the key here is not just exercise. Exercise obviously can improve blood flow to the brain, but also you can improve neuroplasticity and just activate the brain's, the brain's function in general just with physical exercise. And the physical exercise you want to focus on is preferably things that are that requires complex movement. Okay, so what's complex movement? If I just move my arm this way, that's one plane. Complex movement will be things like, you know, when I'm moving in a figure eight, then that's multi-plane, right? So complex movement tend to be better for brain function. And novel movements, something that's new for you. If you just do the same routine all the time, your brain gets used to it, it ceases to, to be challenged. You're not gonna build new pathways. So neuroplasticity depends on novelty. Novelty is one of the factors to stimulate neuroplasticity. So then you wanna learn a new skill, right? So that could be dancing. Dancing is great, especially if you learn a new dance routine, right? If you do a dance routine, then you have to learn the dance routine, and that requires to new, learn a new sequence of movement. That could be great. You can learn to play a new sport, right? Like pickleball or tennis, pick up whatever you like to do. So physical activity that's novel or new is good to help you to stimulate the brain and build that brain power because your brain needs to be activated just to, not only for peak function, but just for brain cells to stay alive, they need to be activated. On the mental side of thing, you wanna do things, again, novelty is important here. So that could be learning a new language. Maybe uh, music, learn to play some musical instrument. Although music, if you're playing an instrument, then that could be physical as well because there's some dexterity involved. But the learning the music itself, there's some mental capacity work there. Uh, you can also be, have a creative outlet, and that could be arts, you know, drawing, crocheting, whatever you, it might be. Doing something creative where you're creating new things or learning new things, right? Learning 
is also very good. The more you learn, the more you get to learn. So that's going to be very important. Now, obviously, for some people, what would the, the, the activation problem come in? Well, if you're very sedentary, you don't ever exercise, then you're not going to get a lot of physical stimulation. Now, some people actually have injuries like concussions or traumatic brain injury. Then they can have specific parts of the brain that can be injured, losing activation because they have injured brain cells that cannot be activated. In that particular case, they will want to activate those injured brain cells. This will be done in the context of rehab, working with a board-certified chiropractic neurologist or functional neurologist. But the example here is if your balance is not good, then the things you do is the balance activity because in the principles of neuro rehab is that whatever you suck at, that's what you would do. Because when you do the things you're not good at, then those brain cells, which are not functioning well, that's why you're not good at it, will be forced to do the work which forces them to grow. And that's what's gonna help with that. So if your balance is not good, do more balance activity. Even more specific, if your balance is worse on the right side, then do more right-sided balance activity to stimulate your brain to activate that. Okay, so that's activation. The last part, non-negotiable to boost your brain power, is that the brain has to have no inflammation. It doesn't like it. It's not good for it. Why is inflammation not good for the brain? Two things. Number one, inflammation can decrease nerve conduction velocity. So you're slowing down brain's ability to send signal from one brain cell to another, then that's gonna cause brain fog, decrease mental endurance, decrease mental capacity, decrease processing speed, depression. So inflammation is gonna impair brain function. Secondly, inflammation can literally destroy brain cells. And if you destroy enough brain cells, then you get neurodegeneration, which leads into Alzheimer and various forms of dementia. So brain requires fuel in the form of oxygen, glucose, it requires activation, and it has to have no inflammation. So where's inflammation of the brain come from? Comes down to identify the root cause. So this could be trauma, like physical injuries, could be stress, could be from blood sugar problems, could be oxygen problem, which is what we just talked about here, right? So if you don't have enough fuel, your brain cells can't work properly, and when brain cells don't have enough fuel, they literally degenerate, and that degenerating brain cell then can become inflamed because your body will try to scavenge up these injured and dead neurons by the microglial cells, so that can cause problem. And then we have dietary influences, right? So food sensitivity, for example, we know gluten can be a, a big problem for neurological tissue. And then toxins, environmental toxins can obviously be a problem for brain cells. Infections can be a problem for brain cells as well, such as chronic viral infections. We know herpes family viruses can get into the brain. Uh, you can have bacterial issues and various other issues that can impact brain. So these root causes are what we wanna identify. Now, just from perspective, okay, if we already, we don't know what's causing inflammation, but we know there's inflammation. What can we do about that? Well, this is where supplement can be very helpful here. So some of the supplements I will recommend will be things like fish oil. Okay, the reason fish oil, because omega-3 fatty acid can shift your inflammatory status from in a pro-inflammatory status to an anti-inflammatory status by manipulating the prostaglandins. And fish oil is important for brain especially because your brain is majority made of structural fat. Okay, your brain is basically fatty tissue, so it needs fat to build itself. And furthermore, the DHA found in fish oil is very important for brain's own structural integrity and anti-inflammatory properties. In fact, in brain injury, your brain literally will take the DHA from fish oil out of your brain's cell membrane in order to dampen inflammation. So we want to have plenty of fish oil to help with controlling inflammation in the brain. Another really critical thing is glutathione. Now glutathione can be very helpful for inflammation because when your brain is inflamed, it's gonna create a lot of oxidative stress. 
Okay, oxidative stress means the brain cells are oxidizing. And glutathione is a master antioxidant, which helped us quench that oxidation and serves as an antioxidant. And now your body naturally produces it, but you only make so much in a day. So if you have more inflammation than your glutathione capacity, then you're going to run into trouble where your brain cells are going to be injured or damaged. So glutathione can be really important here. And then another thing is that you want to use flavonoid compounds that can cross the blood-brain barrier. So this could be turmeric, resveratrol. These are compounds that can be found in food and different flavonoids like grape and curry that can cross the blood-brain barrier and have an anti-inflammatory effect in the brain. Other compounds include quercetin. That's an R and luteolin. Luteolin. So quercetin is a compound that's found in a lot of fruits, citrus fruit, but also in vegetables such as onion, has high amounts of quercetin. And quercetin can serve as a mast cell stabilizer, so it can decrease histamine. Luteolin is a very interesting compound that can, again, cross the blood-brain barrier is found in very high amounts in things like radicchio, which is like a purple cabbage, Chinese celery, can be found in regular celery, in parsley, and even in onion as well. Luteolin has the ability, similar to quercetin, as far as dampening mast cell, it's a Th2 modulator, so it dampens this inf uh, inflammatory and allergic reaction, which can help with overall inflammation. So those are the key supplemental strategies to help decrease inflammation. But of course, we always want to identify the root cause and use lifestyle changes to affect change here. Obviously, identify specific stressor. If you have infection, we may have to do specific things for that. If you have a lot of toxicity, we may have to do some detox procedures. If you have food sensitivity, we may want to eliminate the foods that you're sensitive to. So it can become very individualized. But for starters, I hope you appreciate that your brain cell has three non-negotiables, fuel, activation, and has to have no inflammation. Fuel comes in the form of oxygen and glucose, and there are things that can cause problem there, and there are things, simple things that you can do to start to make an impact. These three things will give you the fastest payoff to boost your brain power. Hope you start to appreciate how wonderfully made our body is. Please let me know in the comments, what's the one thing that you learned? I cover so many things. I wanna know what's the one thing that you learned out of this whole entire video. And if you got a lot of value out of this, please hit the like button. If you have not subscribed already, please subscribe to our channel so you can get notified of more videos just like this. See you in the next video.